All right, good evening, everybody. A uh, little bit late as we get started tonight. I apologize for the technical issues. I blame Rick and his camera work uh, for all of that, but uh, we'll get going here. Um, welcome to the webinar, everyone. I, uh, my name is Wes LeMay. Uh, I am the Dean of the School of Firearms Technology at SDI, and I'm super excited about tonight's webinar. You know, coming off the heels of SHOT Show 2020, uh, I'm glad that you guys are here. And for any of you that were there, uh, I, I hope you survived. I hope you had a great show. Uh, I hope you made it home without catching some of the SHOT Show funk that typically happens when you go in that place after you shake 9,000 people's hands. I know for the few days that I was there, I, I coated myself in hand sanitizer the entire time that we were there uh, to try to prevent some of that. But we are here. Um, Selfishly tonight, I'm extremely excited because tonight we get to showcase one of our full-time faculty members in Rick Kasner, uh, and, and that's a huge thing for us. On the screen tonight, um, you'll also see Brian Dulch down there. Brian is one of our content developers at SDI. He's going to help me monitor the Q&A section and the chat section tonight, which you guys are already uh, involved in based off of some of the technical stuff that we had going on earlier. A um, couple of things for housekeeping that I want you to keep in mind for the Q&A for for, and for the chat. If you have a question for Rick tonight as we go through the webinar, <clears throat> excuse me, keep those in the Q&A section. You'll notice that that is either in your dashboard on the bottom of your screen or over on the right. So just look for the one that says Q&A. Leave that chat section for you to be able to communicate with each other and us. Everything that's not a question. We try to keep those two things separate. In that chat section, it's going to be important for later. Make sure that you, you kind of tag yourself in there. Tell me who you are, where you're from, if you're a student or a graduate, if you're interested in coming to SDI, or if you're just watching. In these webinars, we take all comers, so there is no uh, there there is no discrimination in an SDI webinar about who gets to attend. We're just glad you're here. Now, with that being said, this is an SDI webinar, so I have to do an SDI pitch as we go, as we get started. So bear with me for just a second. Let me cover a few little details here and then we are going to get started since we're already a little behind. For those of you who are unfamiliar with SDI, SDI is an online college accredited by the DEAC and we have two programs. <clears throat> the Advanced Gunsmithing Certificate is 32 college credit hours and the Associate of Science and Firearms Technology is 60 credit hours. All of your coursework is completed online. You have subject matter experts as faculty member in the different classes that you take and SDI ships all of your tools and equipment to you prior to that particular class starting. So once you hit a class that has one of those labs associated with it, prior to that start date for that class, all your materials will show up so that you're ready to go when that date rolls around. If you have questions about SDI guys, there's a couple of ways for you to get in touch with us. First of all, go to our website. It's www.sdi.edu, sdi.edu, okay? That's the easiest way for you to find out more information about the school. Now, if you wanna to speak to someone directly to answer some of those specific questions, I highly recommend that you hit up our admissions department. We have a full team of reps that will answer all of your questions about what SPI is all about and how to get started. Email them directly at admissions at sdi.edu. We try to th keep things simple around here. So admissions at sdi.edu. If you're on the website and you still need some help, if you'll look up in the top right hand corner, you will see a request for info and an apply now button. Either one of those, if you click them, one of those admissions teams will get back to you as soon as they possibly can. So you've got a couple of different ways to reach out to us. <clears throat> now, for the fun stuff as we get ready to get started. Would not be an SDI webinar if we weren't giving away some cool SDI swag. So yes, we're going to do that tonight. Um, and I know that you guys all kind of love that stuff. So at the end of the webinar, we will give some of that away. But there is a kicker. There is an eligibility requirement for the webinar tonight. You have to hang with us to the end of the webinar. Once we get to the end, for folks that have made it all the way through, I'm going to have Brian do a random drawing for folks that are still listed over there that are still hanging inside the webinar. I'm, we're going to pick three people 
And at the end of the webinar, I'll tell you exactly what you need to do for us to be able to send you that swag. And we'll send you out some cool stuff there at the end. That's it for my pitch for SDI. Other than that, remember the Q&A and the chat section and what we use those things for. Outside of that, the pitch is over. So with that, I am ready to introduce Rick and we will get started. Real quick, a little background here. Rick grew up hunting and shooting with his dad. In 2010, he graduated from the Colorado School of Trades for gunsmithing. See, we take all comers here. For several years following his graduation, Rick worked for U.S. Ordnance, so he spent a lot of time working on DOD platforms. He has a lot of experience there. After that, he moved to Colorado and started his own business. He instructed folks and certified them in concealed carry principles. In that time, he decided to continue his education and went on to get both a Bachelor's of Science in 2016 and a Master's degree in 2017. During that pathway of enhancing his education, Rick also worked as a gunsmith and at a reality-based force-on-force training facility in Idaho. Rick came on board as an adjunct faculty member in 2018 with SDI and has recently moved into a full-time position because he's done such a great job with the students at SDI. And with that, we have a lot of information to cover. Rick, I'm going to mute myself and let you kind of take it away and we'll get started and rock and roll through the rest of the webinar. All right. Thank you, Wes. Um, all right. So we have, yeah, we have a ton to cover and this webinar is going to be a little bit different. So pardon me if I, if I'm just going to run, a, run away at the mouth because there is going to be a question and answer. I want to give you guys some time at the end to really be interactive, but for the next 20 minutes, just, just try to listen to me as best you can. Um, the purpose it, for tonight's webinar is really, I've kind of just gotten a hint, well, you know, reading the discussion boards for our students that they're, they're just overwhelmed. They, they've, and I've been there before. You're getting into the gunsmithing world and you think that you have to know every single uh, firearms platform that there is, um, and it's simply not true. What you have to know as a gunsmith is you have to have a, um, and let me, pin my, see here, pin my video so I can not look in sideways. But anyway, you have to, you have to have a firm knowledge and, and understanding in the cycle of operations. And what that does is that allows you to understand the basics of every principle. You could, you could understand if it's short recoil or blowback or gas operated, piston driven, whatever. But understanding the cycle of operations allows you to get rid of all that mess and, and deal with just eight very, very simple steps. And that's what we're gonna go over today. So you guys can kind of rest easy. Um, all, the, all the hobbyists and future gunsmiths or even gunsmiths out there that are struggling with, with having to know that. And it, it's, it's exacerbated if you have that one customer that comes in that knows this one particular platform really well and he looks at you like you're an idiot when you don't know that one. So, that guy aside, and if you're one of those guys, stop it. But that guy aside, you don't have to know every platform. All right, so that's the goal. Now, a little bit about safety before we get into it. Um, gunsmiths, you, you need to have all sorts of safety equipment, ear protection, masks, shields, stuff like that. But for the trouble, the, tr the actual troubleshooting process, all we're gonna be focusing on is our eyes, protecting our eyes from little springs, little plungers, things like that, uh, wood chips or metal shavings, chemicals, things like that. Um, and then also, whenever we're dealing with a firearm, so right here, get where I'm, you can see me. So you, we have a Glock and you can see that we, we have a magazine loaded. We don't know the condition of this firearm, okay? So what we're gonna do is we're gonna clear it properly by removing the feed source and removing that, if it was live ammunition, try to get live ammunition all the way away from your workspace, out of your workspace. And then we're gonna open the action and eject whatever shells, whatever cartridges might be in there, and then set those aside. At this point, we're gonna physically check the chamber, visually check it, as well as checking, checking the magazine well and verifying that it's safe, okay? Now I'm going to switch the camera around and uh, and we're going to get into the actual 
uh, the preliminary checks before we get into the, the cycle of operations. So let me move that around for you. All right, so you guys can see me and hopefully, Wes, can I get a thumbs up if you can hear me? Okay, all right. So preliminary checks, what these are, these are broken down into basically two different, um, two different sections, I guess you could say. We're looking at the exterior of the firearm and there's a couple measurements we'll take on the exterior as well as the interior. And there's a couple measurements that we'll take on, on the interior as well. But for the first little bit, um, when we're looking over a firearm, we're gonna be looking, verifying if there's any manual safeties, anything like that. If there are manual safeties, we wanna check them and, uh, and make sure that they're functional, that they're operational. Right here, I have a, a trigger safety on the Glock. A lot of polymer frame firearms will have the same thing. And again, you wanna check your, your firearm to make sure it's clear. But what I would do is I would just verify that that's, that that's actually functional. And how I do that on this one is I'm, I'm not depressing the actual safety, but I'm just taking the side of the trigger and checking that, make sure that's, that's uh, stopping the trigger like it should. And then, um, and then I and then I actually depress the safety and make sure that the fire firearm actually fires. Okay. Then the, the next thing we're looking at is we're just doing a general flyover of the exterior of the firearm. I'm going to tell you guys right now that 99% of your problems that you're going to run into as a gunsmith, if it's not customization or anything like that, um, is going to deal with dirt and grime. It's just going to be a dirty firearm. You can have broken components, but usually nine times out of 10, I'd say those broken components are a problem, are broken because of dirt and grime. And you could have several broken components within that too. So we're just taking a flyover. We're, we're, we're making sure, we're, we're just verifying that nothing's super dirty or caked on or gross. And you can really see that what, what kind of care the owner takes of this firearm. Um, just by, by the general looks of it. All right, <clears throat> so one of the measurements we wanna take while we still have it together is a, uh, we wanna weigh, weigh the trigger. So usually what you do, and I just have a simple manual uh, scale here. You can get digital ones, but they're not necessary. Um, but anyway, so what we usually do as gunsmiths is we wanna take a measurement of, of about three, uh, trigger weights and then we'll average them. For this purpose, I'm just gonna do one. But what you wanna do is you wanna disengage that safety and put the, the, uh, the uh, um, gauge right on the shoe, the lower, lower part of that shoe of the trigger and pull it back just gradually. We're not trying to yank through and we're gonna see when that, that trigger breaks. And right here, it's breaking about three and a half pounds. So again, you would, you would normally uh, weigh that about three times and you would take the average of those three times. And then, um, yeah. All right, then the next thing that we're gonna do, and for this, I'm gonna grab a 1911, but we wanna check our sear engagement. And the reason I'm not using the Glock is we can't see the striker in the Glock until we take, the, take it apart later. And then at that point, we'll just check the, verify the, the condition of the sear, the condition of the striker, things like that. But when I'm talking about sear engagement, I'm talking about the movement in the hammer or the, the striker itself as we pull the, the trigger rearward. So what we're looking for is three different possibilities. You have positive sear engagement, neutral sear engagement, or negative sear engagement. The only one that we really, really wanna be concerned about is the negative sear engagement. And I'll show you that what that, that looks like. Positive sear engagement um, would be if, if we're pulling the trigger and the, the hammer or the striker is actually coming increasingly in the, or more increasingly into the cocked position, um, that's a very safe trigger pull. It also is a very heavy trigger pull. So a lot of people don't like that. A neutral trigger pull means that there's no movement at all. And a negative uh, sear engagement would be that the hammer or the striker actually creeps forward before dropping and lighten off the round. You don't want a negative sear engagement, that's dangerous. 
a lot of times, it, well, I won't say a lot of times, but sometimes you'll get some, some triggers in where some people have had tried to do their own trigger job, a little two cent trigger job, and they'll end up messing it up and you'll get those negative sear engagements. And it's, that's when you're going to either deny the, deny the job and have somebody su sign it off if they don't want to do a full restore on the trigger or it, personally, I'm not going to let it, I'm not going to either, I'm not going to put my name to something that has a negative uh, or a, a dangerous trigger, if that makes sense. So you either deny it or they accept the work to, to restore the trigger as how it should be and get a proper trigger job. Um, so yeah, so that's what we're looking for in, in these three. And I'll kind of show you guys what I'm, what I look for in that when I'm pulling the trigger, but you guys focus on this hammer and you guys will notice either it's moving or it's not moving as I pull the trigger. Okay, so I didn't notice any movement in that trigger or that hammer as I pulled the trigger. We'll do it one more time. All right, so yeah, there's no, there's no movement in that hammer as we pull, that means that's a neutral, a neutral sear engagement and that's a safe sear engagement. All right, next I'm gonna grab the, uh, the Glock again and, um, and we'll take it apart. And we're, we're into the field strip portion now. So we're gonna look, have a flyover of the interior of the firearm. So generally we're doing the same thing. We're looking, we're having a flyover of all the components within the uh, firearm. And we're looking for dirt and grime and gross, gross nastiness is the technical term. <laughs> and, um, but yeah, this is the time where we can actually start looking at the sear engagement. Let me focus this camera. See if it gets a little better. There we go. So you notice right here on the Glock, right back here, this, this is the sear surface. This engages this this part of the striker right here, that surface. So that's what we're, we're just checking those, making sure that the, that the, uh, the surfaces are still flat, that there's no, no uh, rough edges or anything like that. It's like somebody took a file to it or something. And um, hey, Rick, and we're just, yeah. Can you raise that slide up and focus it in like you did the frame so everybody can see that again? Yeah. Here, let me focus that. There you go. All right, so yeah, so we're just looking at this surface and this is an example of a, a striker fired handgun polymer frame. A lot of them will be very, very similar to the Glock because a lot of them are copycats of the Glock. So um, you'll have a little bit of differences like the Springfield XD will have a little bit of a difference, but, but generally speaking, they're very, very similar. So striker fire, you're looking for that, that at that surface right there. And on the XD, which um, a lot of you guys will be familiar with, is you'll actually be able to see the striker, a, a piece of the striker, uh, an indicator out here um, that it's cocked. And so you'll be able to, to verify the movement in that as well from the exterior, but in the Glock you can't. All right, so generally we're just looking at stuff and then I wanna take a moment for you guys right now, as we're later talking about the cycle of operations, I want you guys to know that you guys can break the firearm down and you start working with it in sub-assembly, uh, sub-assemblies. So you don't have to always work with the gun completely together. You take it apart and you start just moving little things around like this trigger bar. I'm noticing that that's, that, that's functional. Um, you know, I pry on this disconnector right here and make sure that that's doing what it needs to do. And uh, so you're just you're just generally you're just generally kind of playing around with it. And um, and the thing is, is that even though I'm somewhat familiar familiar with this platform, it really only will take you about 15 minutes with any any platform once you get it apart. Just just messing around with it and you really see how it works. Once you understand the cycle of operations, you'll see how similar every, every type of firearm is. All right, so that's generally what we're looking for in the, the main flyover for the interior. One thing that we want to focus on 
in, in depth is the uh, barrel. <clears throat> We got a flashlight here so you guys can hopefully see that so in the barrel what we're looking for is the sharpness of the uh or the condition of the rifling or if it's a smooth board just the condition of the surface is the rifling sharp is it worn Are, we're looking for pitting obstructions um cracks bulges and really kind of just the general construction of the of the um the barrel and you know they they might have been using plus p ammo in this which means plus powder so it's a it's a higher load a hotter load which this barrel wouldn't be rated for so you're looking for any evidence of of past abuse and i wanted to take a second for you guys because maybe some of you guys haven't seen a bulge barrel before so i want to show you hey rick when you get Rick, when you yeah. get a second, we had a question. Can you focus back in on that sear on the Glock for us? Kind of pull that up and reshow that again one more time. We had a question. Want to see that? Can you just repoint that out for us, if you will. Yeah. Can you guys see that well enough? I think that's. It's going to be fuzzy, but here we'll. There you go. Try to focus that better. That's All right. Perfect. So for the. For the sear, you're looking generally at this surface right here. And I'll move the trigger. This is all connected to the trigger bar in the Glock, so you'll see it moving. And you guys will notice, here, let me tip this sideways. You'll notice that it actually pops down. And when it when it is dropping down, you guys will notice it comes back, and then at a certain point, it drops it down. That's when it's gonna release the striker on the the slide itself so it's drawing that striker back and then it'll drop out of the way and then it'll release that striker to go forward excellent thanks rick yeah does that cover it good to go okay all right so then back to the back to the uh back to the bulge barrel an example of that let me focus back in on that. Okay, so this is an old Stevens shotgun right here. And uh, you guys will notice right here, and I'll try to get different light, but this is an actual bulge and a crack. So these are the things, these are the conditions you guys are looking for. We don't want to fire around through that. So if I was actually going to restore this firearm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to cut the barrel right here and reface it um obviously keeping in mind the length of the barrel and make sure you're within legal legal length but yeah so that's uh that's where we would we would cut it off we're trying to get rid of that bulge so that's an example of that okay all right so now while we have the firearm apart we're going to take a few more measurements and for this, I need to track down my where my gauges. I have I have this little fire pin protrusion, firing pin protrusion uh, gauge that I made on a lathe. But you can actually get these on Brownells. I think they're about forty bucks. But if you're handy with a lathe, you can just make your own. Um, but what it is, what it consists of, is a set screw, the main body, and then a little center shaft in there. And so what you're doing is you're putting this center shaft over the top of the firing pin when it's protruding so that you have a convenient way of measuring the fire pin protrusion. So what I would do is I would measure it with a pair of calipers, get the overall length, and we're sitting at about 900 thousandths there. So then I would drop it in and set that center shaft over the firing pin. And then I would set the set screw again. And there's various ways of, of measuring the, uh, the firing pin protrusion, but this is a convenient way of doing it. And then I would re-measure. And I was off on that one because it's about 57,000, so. 
doing it on camera is a little weird. Yeah, so what I'm gonna do is reestablish that and then measure again. Yeah, and so we're sitting about, now we're, we're sitting at about 958 thousandths. So we can count that as about a 58 thousandths uh, firing pin protrusion. And generally speaking for center fire rifles, center fire handguns, we want about 50 to 60 thousandths of an inch. Shotguns, we want about 55 to 65 thousandths of an inch and rim fire about 28 to 35 thousandths of an inch for firing pin protrusion. Now, the only time I would really worry about that though, is if you're dealing with misfires or in the more te technical term, uh, failure to fire. and um, or pierced primers. So a pierced primer would be dealing with a fire pin protrusion that's too long, and uh, failure to fire would be something that's too short. I run into that far more often. Just over time, firing pins wear out, they get shortened, um, and uh, yeah. So, so that's just something to worry about later at a different time. But if you're not having problems with failure to fire or, or uh, Pierce primers, it's not really a, a super big concern. All right, next thing I want to move on to is head spacing, proper method for head spacing. Hey, Rick, before you dive into that, uh, yeah. we got someone with a question. They said, understand the reasoning for checking the sear and trigger relationship. What is the reason for measuring the trigger pull on initial inspection? Um, and I know there's probably a, a, a ton of different ways to answer that. When you go through this process with uh, a new firearm that comes to you. Why do you check that up front like you did as we walked through tonight? Well, there's a couple different reasons I do. Um, I think that when it's like, it's like taking your baby into the doctor, you kind of want to get them all checked out and that they're, that they're have healthy, you know, a healthy bill of, of health or whatever, or a good bill of health. Um, but there's also the legality on your side. You want to make sure that you're sending out. That's why you're checking the sear engagement and the trigger weight. So if you have negative sear engagement and that trigger weight is super light, you're into the ounces. That's that's something I'm gonna I'm gonna shy away from. I'm either gonna, you know, say you know I can't take this job or or uh, or we fix it. But then that way you figure it out right up front. So you're not messing around with the firearm and then at, you know, when you've already charged this guy or you've already racked up the bill to, you know, $150, you're not saying, oh, and by the way, you need a new trigger now, you know, and I'm not leaving and letting it leave my shop until you get a new trigger in there. So that's, that's kind of what is my rationale. Absolutely. Thank you, sir. Uh-huh. Okay. People want to know what's going on inside their firearms. It's pretty cool to get that that report and they can say, oh, this is, you know, and they can keep it for their records of all the measurements that you've taken and things like that. All right. So for head spacing. Right here I have a AR style or LR style for those guys that are going to call me out on that uh, firearm. Um, we have what we're going to do is we're going to want to remove if you guys have a dynamic ejector which means it's spring loaded in the bolt face um instead of versus fixed in the receiver or something like that like this this would be an example in this glock you have the ejector right here um that would be a fixed ejector versus a dynamic ejector would be uh, a spring loaded ejector in the bolt face um I'm going to want to remove that because for my headspace gauges, which are hardened steel, I'm not going to want any pressure canting those any one way. Now, I did remove the extractor as well. You don't necessarily have to do that, but I did and I do like to do it. If you don't remove it, be sure to, to hook the, the rim of the, the headspace gauge up underneath that extractor so you're not trying to pop the extractor over this hardened steel possibly damaging your extractor or the, the chamber. Another note, we do not want to run the bolt or the slide or anything like that under spring pressure, drive spring or recoil spring 
pressure. We want to run it under our, our just hand pressure. All right, so moving forward, and, and I saw, sorry, another note. You want to know where your gun, what your gun looks like when it locks up. All right, so without a, without a headspace gauge, just look, look at the firearm and see how it, how it locks up and how the frame or the slide to the barrel uh, interacts or the bolt carrier group to the receiver interacts and, and just how that, that indicates off of each other, if that makes sense. Um, and so, so then that way you can see if it's a proper lockup or not. So with headspace gauges, you have a go gauge and you have a no-go gauge. This right here, I don't know if you guys can see it, but that's the go gauge. And then we have a no-go and it would actually be marked on there. No-go gauge. Anyway, so what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna slip this, the go gauge in first into the chamber. And I'm going to run the bolt in, the bolt carrier group. <clears throat> and again, on spring pressure or on hand pressure, I'm gonna just push it forward and make sure it locks. With this particular firearm, I'm gonna want the bolt carrier group, the rear of the bolt carrier group to um, be flush with the rear of the upper receiver. So I'm just gonna push it forward. And you see there that it did, it did go flush with the upper receiver. We're just gonna do the same thing with the uh, no-go gauge. And I just have a little magnet here. Since, you, since I don't have the extractor, I just pull it out with a magnet. If you guys don't have a, have a, uh, a no-go gauge, what you can do is you can just put a shim of masking tape on the back of the go gauge and masking tape will crush to around 2,000. So it, between the no-go and the go gauge, you have about a 4,000 difference. So if you're crushing and you're not closing on that tape, um, you're good to go. And you could even double up that tape if you wanted to, two layers of tape just to check. And if it's not closing, then you should be fine. And then you can take the tape off the back afterward and measure it with a pair of calipers just to see what the measurement was. But what we're looking for now is for it to not close. And so we see that's as far forward as it'll go. And it didn't, it's not flush with the rear of the receiver there. So that's head spacing. I'm sure I'll have more, more questions about it in the Q&A, but that's kind of a general flyover. And that's, those principles apply to any, any firearm you're gonna be head spacing. And I would counsel everybody out there just to head space everything that you're going to um, that you're gonna test fire. You don't know the measurement of that chamber and you just wanna protect yourself. So, all right, any questions? Let's, let's do questions. Is there anything in the Q&A? There is. Uh, so I'm gonna run through these. We'll, uh, guys, we may not hit all of them. Uh, I, I was gonna definitely put a note out at the end. Um, but just so you guys know ahead of time, if we don't get to all of your questions, this webinar is going to be recorded. Um, so once we get to the end of the webinar, I'll announce where you can find that information kind of after the fact. So if I skip through there, uh, bear with me. Um, Rick, Chris says on a 1911, you can see the positive, negative, and neutral, but how do you tell on a Glock? <clears throat> yeah, on it, well... On a Glock, you can kind of feel it, but what you're looking for on a Glock, you can kind of just tell what's gonna happen. Let me measure this or focus that again. It's gonna be hard to focus in on this. Put it there. Basically what you're doing is you're looking, you're looking on the back of this, this sear engagement and you're looking for a flat surface. If anyone's angled it or, or messed with it in any way, it'll be angled. And so you can tell what would be a negative just by messing around with it, what would be a negative and a positive. And you're going to be doing the same thing on with the uh, striker on the actual the slide. Uh, you'll be looking at this surface and if they've rounded any edges or whatever, 
and just experience in general with this. And it, it doesn't take too much, but just, just kind of playing around with it, put the slide back on the frame and just kind of feel what it'll feel like. But if you have a negative sear engagement, it's going to be, it's going to be most likely really gritty because it doesn't come from the factory like that. And it's going to be kind of just, just a long, nasty trigger pull. But you'll, you'll also probably feel that it's, it's creeping forward a little bit. Does gotcha. they answer? What's yeah, that? I, I, I think that's about as deep as you could probably get uh, in this webinar. Hey, I'm going to give you two more before we roll to the next section here. Okay. Uh, Angel says, if bed spacing is off, what are the next steps that I need to follow? Um, give, give me the down and dirty version of that. <clears throat> okay, that, that depends on the platform you're dealing with. If it's a bolt action rifle, I would be taking the, the barrel off at that point. And depending on the condition of the interior, of the bore or the chamber, I might just, uh, you know, set the shoulder and the the breech face back a little bit. Um, however, however far it is, so you can take the same measure, the same way we were going to do the masking tape. You can take your your no go gauge, and you can put your masking tape on the back, and you can actually layer it up, and say, okay, at this point, it doesn't close anymore like it should on a on a no-go and then you can take that masking tape off and measure that with a pair of calipers or micrometers would give you a, a more uh precise measurement but um but then you can you can <clears throat> on a lathe set that that shoulder and the breech face back on a bolt action rifle on a uh, ar platform i would just replace the barrel and the same would go for a short recoil with like a Glock. You would just be re replacing the barrel because there's really no machining that you're going to do as a gunsmith uh, to to fix that. If it's too long of a of a headspace, I would just do that. So anyway. Nope, you're good. Uh, I, I'm going to answer this one for you, and you jump in and tell me if I'm wrong. Daniel asks, if you can only afford one gauge, would it be better to get a go gauge or a no-go gauge? Uh, Daniel, I would say that you're better off getting a go gauge. Just as Rick explained, there are ways for you to manipulate that gauge to get it to do the no-go piece that you're looking for. Um, Rick, feel free to jump in if I missed something on that. I just thought that was an easy one for us to tag real quick. No, nope, that's perfect. That sounds good. Uh, some of these we kind of answered as we go. Someone asked a questions about uh, bore scopes. Uh, absolutely. That's a great investment. Even for a hobbyist, you definitely want that thing to be able to see. Um, and we'll kind of go from there. Uh, Rick, I'm going to let you move forward so that we can keep everything moving. Um, okay. And here's the thing, guys, depending upon what the response is tonight, if you guys like this style of webinar, we can always do a part two where we get into some more detail with some specific stuff. So I'm going to let Rick keep going. Go ahead, Rick. All right. So we're going to get into the, the cycle of operations. And in the cycle of operations, you have eight steps. And my students are going to, I mean, they've done this over the last eight weeks. So, I mean, they're gonna do this throughout their whole, their whole gunsmithing career. This is, as a gunsmith, the most important thing you guys can learn. Even if you're customizing or building a custom rifle, you want to know the cycle of operations. And what this does is this allows us to, within each of these, these eight steps of the cycle of operations, you'll have multiple components that are at play in that step, but they're not at play in this step down here. So what we can do is we can say, okay, this firearm, this particular Glock is having an, a failure to, fi to fire or a failure to chamber or a failure to feed. And what we can do is we can say, okay, within that, that feeding step in the, in the Glock, these specific components are at play. So now I don't have to look at the trigger. I don't have to look at the chamber even for a feeding step. I can look at um, the uh, the magazine, the breech face, or the the slide face, the breech face on the slide. Um, you know those components, so I can start isolating the components that are at play um, within that that step in the cycle of operations. So I'm going to quickly go through that, but that was kind of a, a flyover, and we're going to be. And to, to read them out loud to you guys, your eight steps are feeding, chambering, locking, firing, unlocking, extracting, ejecting, and cocking. All right. 
So to give you kind of an example of what this looks like um, in, a, in a proper functions check, and I get on a lot of students about this part. So if you're one of those students out there, and a big shout out to my former students and, and uh, current students and prospective students. I'm happy to have you guys here. But anyway, I get on a lot of them when they're in FTT 111 because they do the, the simple functions check, which is you rack the slide, you pull the trigger, oh, yep, it's shot, and then you rack the slide and check the reset, and it's good to go. And you think that's, that's all a gunsmith should know. But as a gunsmith, you, you're, not, you're not only concerned about the firing of that, of that firearm. You're concerned about every single step in the cycle of operations. How does that firearm function? So in the, the, the proper functions check methodology, there's three things, where, three kind of steps. We're going, we're going to go slow and dry at first, which, which is no, no uh, dummy rounds, nothing, no snap caps. Then the second is we're just doing medium speed and we're gonna have snap caps. That's gonna verify or, or assess uh, certain steps within the cycle of operations that the first one won't. And then the last step, we're gonna be doing our, our fast uh, and our live fire. So that's gonna be um, you know, functioning at full speed. All right, so for the first step, for the first part of the, the functions check, we're just going to you know, just be generally feeling for the smoothness of the firearm. I'm checking at this point the locking and the unlocking of the of the the barrel to the slide. Um, you know, we could check the trigger at this point again, verifying that there's no no ammo in there. But check the trigger, make sure that there's a the, that we're firing. We can check the reset of the trigger. But generally, that's what we're looking for. We're just looking for the smoothness of the action. Then we're going to insert a magazine or a feeding source uh, with snap caps. And we're going to run this at medium speed. We're going to check everything. All right. So at this point, I know that it fed and it chambered. At least I assume so. I can pull the slide back and I can verify, yep, it did feed and chamber. We're locked up. I can feel that across the, the slide. At this point, now we're on the firing step, so I would pull the trigger. It did fire, keep my finger to the rear, the trigger to the rear, and then eject the cartridge, and then load another round. So we extracted, we ejected, and now we're on the, the caulking, the reset is part of the caulking, and on a Glock, you're actually finished caulking when you pull that trigger again because that sear is grabbing that, that striker a little bit further. This is, a Glock is kind of in between a, a double action and a single action. It's neither, neither of them, but um, it's kind of somewhere in between. So it finishes the caulking step. Yeah, safe action. Thank you. <laughs> um, that's Derek, that's one of my former students. So anyway, but yeah, so safe action pistol. So they differentiate it. Um, between, a, between a, um, a single action, double action. All right, so that's that. That's how we're doing the, the, uh, the functions check. But a quick note on the actual uh, live fire portion of the, the functions check is we're, um, we're checking, you wanna check the brass, you wanna keep the brass. This tells you a lot of good information about the condition of your, your uh, your chamber, if there's bulging or frosting on the, the brass itself, um, is there blowback, gas blowback on the, on the, the uh, um, you know, on the, the brass. It tells you the condition of your, of your uh, striker, your firing pin. It also can, tells you the condition of, of the pressures within the, the uh, if the load was too hot, you might have a bulge primer things like that. So definitely keep your brass. That tells you a lot of good information. Yeah, Rick, I think that's a, a super important, important piece that very often gets forget. We, we look and focus on the platform and we forget to take a look at what that brass, because it tells us a story uh, of mm -hmm. what's happening in there as well. 
can can you, as we've kind of covered some of these eight steps, can you talk to me very often in, in, in the industry, we hear terms of things like in battery and out of battery and how that applies to cycle of operations. Can you touch on what those two things are as well? Yeah. Okay. So in battery would be, it's, it's relating to the locking of, of the firearm. So in battery would be, uh, this is this is an example of a firearm that's fully in battery. I don't know where that actually came from, that term. It's something I use all the time, but I don't know where it came from. So I don't know, I don't have the history on that. But basically, if you're full in, you're in battery, it means that it's it's locked up, it's it's ready to go. If you're out of battery, what might happen is you had a failure to chamber, and you might have something like that where it's, it's, not, it's not fully locked up, and the novice on the shooting range might not notice that. They wouldn't notice that back here on the back of the slide, that it's not, it's not fully forward, it's just, it's just back just a little bit, and not a lot of people would notice that, but your gunsmiths or your avid shooters would definitely, um, would definitely start noticing, or would notice that. But anyway, so that's what that in battery and out of battery is referring to. Did I kill that one? You got it. Thanks, sir. All right. So we're going to get to question and answer here pretty soon, but I wanted to point out a couple oddities that frustrate my students, and I wanted to kind of appease them on this. The first, and this is relating to the cycle of operations, the first is the feeding and the chambering. And so why are those separate? Why are they separate steps? And for, for an example, I have this, this Steven shotgun again. And this is a break action. And even in this break action, the, the feeding and the chambering are two distinct steps. And the reason for that is you, you want to isolate components or, or parts that are, that are at play during those, those um, those steps. You don't want to start merging all these steps because then it gets gets to be a muddy mess. Um, what you want to do, is, so in this break action, my the actual feeding mechanism would be my my hand, my fingers. But but where does the feeding and the chambering, where where's that line drawn between those two? And I like to tell students, and this is the way I see it in my mind, is whenever those feeding the feeding mechanisms, and you you think of a, a shotgun, a, a, a pump action shotgun. Um, your carrier it feeds or, you know, you have all this stuff and then the carrier brings it up. But once that bolts, bolt uh, comes forward and it's the shell is no longer, the cartridge is no longer on the carrier. It's now the bolt's job. That's what I would consider the, the chambering step, okay? Feeding is done, chambering has begun, okay? That's going to differ depending on the, the platform, but in, in a, for example, in a, in a break action, once my fingers have stopped doing the job and I'm now closing this action and the breech face is finishing, uh, is, you know, pushing the, the cartridge the rest of the way in, that's the chambering step, okay? And you can have a malfunction in the chambering step, but not in the feeding or, or vice versa. So you want to keep those, those separate. All right, and then for locking and unlocking, I have a Ruger 1022. And the reason I bring this one out is because this is an example of a blowback action. And with blowback actions, you don't actually, you don't actually uh, have any locking mechanism whatsoever. All you have is the, uh, and, and not in the traditional sense at least, you, all you have is the weight of the bolt and the strength of the recoil spring. So if we're having a failure to lock or a failure to unlock, I'm going to start looking um, at the strength of the of the recoil spring. Now, I have a lot of students, and I have Greg here that said that that's unclear in the text. And yeah, it's it's really confusing because you also have actions that are um, that are delayed blowback. But what what you're let me get my Glock just to show you. So what you're looking for is 
there's no there's no delay necessarily in a in a in a short recoil like a Glock because you actually have the bolt or the slide and the barrel bolt slash slide and the barrel are traveling together locked for a short time and then they're unlocking. Whereas with a delayed blowback, they're not ever locking, it's just delaying, but it's still in the process of, of coming rearward. It just has to move some components out of the way. It's, it's, I know it's hazy, but keep playing with it in your mind and you'll, listen, you'll understand it someday. But anyway, so that's that's basically what it is. You just you don't have the the uh, the true locking mechanism. So anyway, all right. And then with the last one, we have the 1911 for the firing step. Let me grab that. All right. And the reason I brought this out, the 1911, there's a couple couple different reasons. First of all. For the firing step, you have um, with any firearm that you have a, a, a manual safety that can impede the firing step within the cycle of operation. So you want to check those those while you're um, while you're assessing the firing. And so for this for this particular platform, we would engage one or disengage one safety while keeping the other safety engaged, pull the trigger, okay? And then we would disengage the other while keeping the other engaged, pull the trigger, and nothing should happen during those steps. Now, when we disengage both of them, we should get uh, the firearm firing functioning properly, which this one does. Another point for the firing on the 1911, and this goes back to fire pin protrusion. A 1911 is an example of, of a, uh, has a firing pin, and this actually has a return spring, whereas the Glock has a spring that's uh, pushing the, the striker forward. The, the 1911, the spring is trying to draw the, the uh, firing pin back. So you, the springs are doing opposite things. So in the 1911, you actually have what we call an inertia-driven firing pin. And you guys will notice how far forward you guys can see that firing pin. So if I were to measure that firing pin protrusion, that's probably like 300 thousandths or something like that. But it doesn't come back, it doesn't come that far forward. It's gonna hit the primer and that resistance is just gonna stop it. And then the spring pressure will draw that firing pin back. So this is important to to know. On some of this, you can't measure fire pin protrusion. You would just look at the depth of the the indentation on the primer itself, because this is an an example of an inertia driven firing pin. All right, Wes, that kind of wraps it up. I have some examples, but I want to turn it over to the students if we can. Yeah, sure. I the, w one thing, guys, as we get into the to the Q&A, to, to Rick's point, and I saw some things in there about uh, the eight steps and repeating those. Guys, like I said, we'll have this thing recorded. Just remember this, every firearm that you encounter is gonna go through those steps. And Rick, I uh, greatly appreciate you bringing a couple of different examples out to kind of walk them through that process of what that looks like. It doesn't matter if it's a break action shotgun or a revolver or your AR-15, it's still gonna go through those steps. Now, it may be you, uh, as, as the human component that's actually doing some of that, but it is still going to go through those same steps. Um, at this point, I'm going to go on mute. I'm going to let Brian. Uh, Brian's going to kind of pop in here and kind of field some of that Q&A to you, Rick, and we'll kind of come to the end. Brian, go ahead. Yep, let me uh, scroll through some of these real quick. I had one and I lost it here. Uh, I've got one from uh, Jorge. So this weekend I saw a Gen, uh, 19, or Glock 19 with scratches on top of the sear. Is that negative? The slide was also creeping forward. Well, if the, if the slide is creeping forward, that's not necessarily the same thing as the striker. So on this Glock, we have the slide, um, but the striker on the inside is is not really connected to the slide itself. So 
if the slide is creeping forward, that's that that would lead me to believe that's something to do with the the chambering process or the locking process, possibly. I would start looking at those those cycle or those steps. Um, the actual striker, and let me switch the camera around again. So did he say it was on top of the striker? Uh, let's see here. Uh, let's see. There were scratches on top of the sear. Is that oh, a negative? Uh, the slide was also creeping forward. Yeah. So you'll get you'll get little uh, little little. Uh, I guess you could not really striations, but you'll get little scratches on top of the sear right here, which is you know some people call it the crucifix because it's like a cross. But um, but yeah, on the on the sear you'll get that. Um, if they're deep gouges, that's something to look at, but not necessarily here. And we're, and this is not a critical surface, really. The critical surface is right, right back here, that, that thin edge. And that's a, a good thing to point out. When you guys are doing trigger jobs, it's very, very important to know the difference between a critical surface and a non-critical surface. If it's a non-critical surface, you might even be able to just buff it out and, and make it really slick and shiny um, because you're just you're just worrying about surfaces gliding across each other. Whereas if it's a critical surface right back here, that's that's the the safe part. That's where you, what you want to be safe and clean and sharp. Um, there's ways of going about cleaning that surface up for a proper trigger job, but that's really this this surface right here is what you're focusing on for a Glock. And then you're focusing right here on the, the front of the uh, striker itself. All right, I got uh, another one for you. Uh, where does chambering fall in revolvers? <clears throat> yeah, so, so that's, that's an important one. That's just like the brake action. So just like the brake action, my feeding device would be my hands, right? And if we look at the, the actual cycle of operations you have feeding chambering locking so you start to ask yourself well where does the locking step fall in the uh, cycle of operations well the chambering step would right be right before that right so you have your revolver the cylinders rotating and right before the locking uh the locking of that cylinder takes place you're going to have the chambering as well Again, it's not in the traditional sense of it actually entering a chamber, but if you think of it, it's bringing it in line. It's it, that chamber is coming in line with the uh, with the um, the barrel itself. And in a revolver, you're not going to necessarily have a failure to chamber. You're going to have a failure to lock. It's not going to be and and what that what that would be termed as is a is a timing issue at that point. So you're going to be looking at the hand or the ratchet, things like that. Good job, Rick. That's about a, the best way to answer that you possibly can. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Got time for some more, Wes? Yeah, let's hit uh, let's hit maybe a couple of more, and then we'll kind of wrap this thing up. I got a couple of notes to put out to everybody at the end. Okay. I uh, got one from Alan Price. Can you explain off-axis? Mm, I don't know what he means by off, oh off axis uh, as far as the uh, delayed delayed blowback off axis. I believe that's what he. I'm guessing that's what he's, what he's, he's yeah. talking about. So off axis would be like a um, an example of that would be oh, a Chris Vector or um, well let me get the barrel really quick of the of the Glock and show you with this. Um, Chris Vector, there's a couple, there's a French, a French gun, I think it's the, uh, what is it, the something 49. Um, but anyway, um, what off axis means is, so you have your bore axis right here, it's the center line of your bore. Off axis, it's a delayed, a delayed blowback because you're actually tipping that back. So, so because you're, 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 um, oh, 
because your energy is not traveling straight back, it doesn't have the same um, effect on the, the bolt. So if you're tilting that bolt and it's actually traveling at a different axis than the bore axis, you, that's a delaying mechanism. And so you can have, uh, you don't have as heavy of a bolt, you don't necessarily have to have as heavy of a recoil spring as you would if it was directly on axis with the, bar the center of the barrel. If that yeah. makes sense. Yeah, like that Chris Vector, that energy is going back and down as opposed yeah. to linear, like what you're talking yeah. about. Yeah, it's coming like this. Correct. Down into the handle. Uh, so that's why you can get away with, in blowback actions, you can actually get away with quite heavy loads, um, surprisingly. All right, Brian, let's get one more and we'll kind of come to a close here for tonight. All right, let's see. I had one here from from Shane. Uh, are there any indications that a 1911 inertia-driven firing pin spring is going bad besides not firing? Well, the, the 1911 will still fire with a bad uh, spring, a weak spring, because all that you're doing all the springs doing in the 1911, it's not like it, like I said, it's not like the Glock where it's actually propelling the, the firing pin forward. The, the spring is drawing it back. So it's actually retracting that, um, that uh, firing pin. And the reason for that is, is if it didn't, it might mess with the feeding step in the cycle of operations because that firing pin would just be sticking out. So, so your, your spring in there, 1911, is actually retracting the firing pin. And you could generally just feel it. Also, what you would do is you would look at the primer. And if that firing pin, the dent in the primer is actually, let me get the, if, that's, if, if that seems a bit too deep to you, um, or if you're starting to pierce the primers, that might be something to look at. And, and then you would just feel the, feel the, uh, the spring and see if it if it's, feels weak. Hopefully they answered the question. I don't hear anything, so that's good. That's good news, I guess. <laughs> All right, so yeah, that's that's kind of the rundown. All right, well, guys, thank you so much for hanging to the end. It looks like we're still sitting at, what, Brian? I see 154. Right, that, that of you guys that have still hung in there. Uh, I want to say thank you to Rick, uh, and I want to thank all of you for participating and hanging in there with us tonight. This is exactly what happens when our VP of marketing, who normally runs these, is not here, and you got three gun dudes trying to figure out the tech side of this thing. So thank you for hanging with us uh, and, and letting us get through that piece of it. Um, Rick, you did a great job. Uh, th you. This is a this is a very in depth topic. Um, and each one of those things, depending on the platform that you guys are looking at out there, whether it's your own or you're looking at one for a customer or whatever the case might be, it, it, you can go on and on and on. And there are rabbit holes that you can jump down. Um, and those are things that we can take a look at as well. Um, I hope you guys all learned something tonight. Um, I know I did. Uh, at this point, Brian, can you give me... Uh, three folks that have made it here to the end that are still online and let's give away some swag before we get out of here. So three? Yes, give me three. Uh, let's go with Darren Howard. All right, Darren Howard. Michael Clouston, C-L-O-U-S-T-O-N. And Greg Boatwright. Outstanding. All right, so fantastic. We got three folks. Say their name one more time, can you? Can you repeat it one more time? Or do you have to? <laughs> Dude, Never mind. <laughs> you, you heard your name. So if, if you didn't hear your name, we'll pick three more. Um, hey, guys, here's the deal. This is what I want you to do. So listen up. Get something to write with. Think, think through this thing. This is what you got to do. I need for you three that your name was called to send an email to marketing at sdi.edu, M-A-R-K-E-T-I-N-G at sdi.edu, marketing at sdi.edu. In that email, put your name, your address, and the title of tonight's webinar. And I will make sure that the marketing department gets something kicked out to you. 
Guys, if you have any questions about SDI, what we do here, go to the website and check us out, sdi.edu. Click on that request info button or apply now button. As I said earlier, you can always directly contact the admissions team by sending an email to admissions at sdi.edu for more information as well. Thanks again to Rick and to all of the attendees. Brian, I appreciate the help tonight. Guys, we have recorded the webinar. Now it takes a little bit for everything to upload once I get it over to the marketing department, but if there is something that you missed or you needed something repeated that we did not have a chance to come back to tonight, Give us just a little bit. It usually takes a couple of days, and we upload these webinars to the Sonoran Desert Institute YouTube channel. So you can find this webinar on YouTube here very, very shortly. Um, also, send your ideas. That tonight, we had some great feedback that was coming in and out of here. If you guys have more topics, if you want this one expanded on, if there are other things that you want to see in these webinars, email that same marketing department marketing at sdi.edu. Feed them your ideas. We have the staff to be able to do it. Let us know what you guys want. Uh, we would rather, we would love to have these things uh, orchestrated in a manner that you guys most want to see. Uh, again, thank you for attending tonight. I hope you guys all have a great 2020. Do not hesitate to reach out to the school if you ever need something. And with that, good night, everyone, and enjoy the rest of your evening. Thank you. Good, good to have you students on. I really, I like seeing my former students and, and current students. It's awesome. So. Great job, guys. See ya.